In this video, I'm gonna share with you pro tips when it comes to breaking technique. Race drivers, this is Enzo with another episode of the Race Driver Coach Show. And as you know, we're talking about braking today. Something that's bloody important. If you want to improve your lap times, or if you want to be a race driver, you've got to get your braking down. Now, when I go on the internet now, I look and I search for braking techniques now and then and, and different things. But what I noticed is that most of the people out there, the videos and the blogs out there, they're teaching the bloody basics. The kind of things that you teach people at race school or when it's a new person, a new driver to the industry, to the sport, and you're teaching them the very fundamentals of this is how you should brake. This is a brake shape, what it should look like. This is how to trail brake. This is how to brake with ABS. This is a traction circle, blah, blah, blah. Okay, very good. But that's all textbook stuff. If you want to become a master at something, then I'm afraid you got to look at the textbook and you pretty much got to rip it up. Okay, it's good to know the fu fundamentals, right? Just to understand, okay, there's certain rules that you have under braking, but they're not going to help you win. And just to give you an example of what I'm getting at here, the difference between understanding something at the basic level and mastering it as an art form, which driving's pretty much like that, right? It is an art. The master in the art of braking is the master in the art of driving. But when I, yeah, a little story. I went on a ski trip with the family. And whilst I was on it, for the first day or so, it was only a short trip, first day or so, I did skiing lessons. It was the first time I went. Years ago, this was. It's actually the only time I went. And yeah, so you got an instructor, did the skiing lessons. You got like 10 of you in the class and you're learning all the good stuff, right? <laughs> the basics, like putting the boots on properly, um, putting the skis on, taking them off, how to get up off the, off the snow itself, what to do if you're going to a fall and all this stuff, right? And it's taking forever. And I'm thinking, come on, mate, just teach us how to go down a slope, please. And after the first day, I was kind of bitching about it to my brother. And my brother's really good, right? A really high level. And he was like, dude, just come with me. I'll teach you much faster. And you just follow what I do and, and you'll figure it out. Which is kind of scary, right? Because I'm supposed to be this person who can't, can barely snow plow. And now I'm going to follow someone who's some dude who's really good. But actually... It sped the learning curve up. It was a big, steep learning curve, right, to ski and how many times you're face plant and stuff. But it's, it was quicker. Learning off somebody who kind of paraphrases things, shortcuts what you actually do need and discards all the information you don't need. Man, I learned how to ski much quicker. And I was only there for like four or five days, but I was much better than I would have been if I'd just bloody done the classes. Similar to race driving. And actually, when you're talking about, I'm talking about the art of things, look at people like Hans Zimmer right? One of the best composers in Hollywood right now, most famous ones anyway. For gladiator, films like Gladiator, Batman, you name it, he's put so many um, amazing soundtracks to films. And he was someone who only did two weeks of piano lessons when he was six years old or so. And even then the teacher was like, either he goes or I go. So he was no good. So he wasn't really, and he doesn't even read music now. It, it baffles him when he reads music. And it's like, hang on a minute, you're a composer. You're supposed to read music. This is the fundamentals, the, the way you're supposed to do it, like the textbook again says. But he's like, no, nah, I've got to create sounds. Sounds that create a story around a character or a situation of what's going on. It creates a whole atmosphere. So I need to listen to a sound, know the character, know the kind of, even where the story goes. And I need to put that into the film to make it real so the people that are watching are actually there. They're feeling it through the music. That's art. That's someone who's mastered composing, right? And this is kind of what I'm attempting to do here with this video and with all my videos. I don't want to teach you the basics that everyone's bloody out there talking about. I want to teach you the difference between what makes a good driver compared to what makes, or the bit I want to teach is what makes them great. You know, I'm working with F1 drivers and, and people that are on the F1 ladder. They do stuff different. You won't get them doing the same kind of things that someone on a track day will do or someone who's at the start of their career. They do things through feel. They do things through having the intelligence, the race driver's intelligence of doing stuff. That's hard to teach and you won't see that in a book. And one more example. 
It's like if you're old enough now to have passed your test, what do they teach you in the, in the lessons? They teach you things like push and pull the wheel because this is how you remain in control of the vehicle at all times. Never take your hands off the wheel, slide them. Okay, brilliant. Another thing is uh, put in the clutch before you do an emergency stop so you don't stall the thing. Okay, so you're not using engine braking, fine. But as a race driver, these things would probably kill you or they'd put you in a shunt because if you have a slide, because as a race driver, you do cross your hands, right? You want to cross your hands because you want to know exactly where the wheel is point. The wheels are pointing. If you push and pull, you're adding lock without even knowing. And if you get a slide, you ain't got a clue where the wheels are. And you're going like a frantic man, uh, getting a, a snap, a tank slapper because you, your wheel's all over the place. Or if you're trying to brake as late as possible, but you're putting the clutch in first. Whoa. Engine braking gone. Someone's going to hit you from behind because you're braking early. It just doesn't work. So that's what I'm trying to get at here. I want to teach you the pro tips, the things that actually do matter and will make you faster, not just understand the basics of braking. So now I've got off my pedestal. Pro tip number one is you must understand the actual braking technique for your car, the specific braking technique for the car that you're driving, because you're gonna brake in different ways, whether it's a GT car, whether it's a Formula Ford or a Formula 3. Each of those cars, very different braking technique. Let me just show you now on this slide. To start off with, we go to Snetterton, turn one. Now this is super high speed, but it's great because we can see the braking technique for this type of corner. And now we can see the three data traces of the three cars. You've got the GT3 at the top, the Formula Ford, and then the Formula 3 at the bottom. You can see the very different brake shapes and braking techniques for this type of corner, high speed. With the GT car, it's a dome shape. Really try not to upset the car at that speed, so being very gentle. Then with the Formula Ford, you can see that it's slightly harder. The wheel is still straight, so it doesn't matter. But then as the car turns in, which you can't see it on this data trace, but as the car turns in, they start to lift off and adjust their braking with the balance of the car. So as the car gets unsettled, the driver will start to drop the brake to bring the weight back to the rear. And then with a Formula 3 car, as you can see, this is completely different. Really, it's just a lift with the tiniest amount of brake going in just to not unsettle it, which I'll explain later on. So as you can see, different cars, not one size fits all. Then staying at Snetterton, turn two, why not? It's a hairpin, it's a completely different corner, much slower, first or second gear corner. And if we go back to the data traces now for the three cars, you can see on the GT3 car, it's a huge brake, and what we call pretty much a tabletop brake. The only reason the driver comes off the brake here is because the ABS is cutting in. So they have to adjust to stop the ABS cutting in, and then a nice trail off, a slight coasting phase and then on the power. With the Formula Ford, you, this, this guy is actually braking with his right foot, so he comes off the throttle onto the brake, so there's a big gap here, unlike the other two cars, because he's using one foot for braking, so it's obvious. Again, a bit of a tabletop, top, sorry, adjusting for when the car's starting to lock up, and again, an even longer phase, waiting for the car to settle. And then Formula 3, Nice little crossover here, bang, front loaded the brake, which means basically that whilst the downforce is on and you've got all that grip being pushed into the ground and you're gaining that grip, should I say, from the downforce, this is when the driver really maximizes the brake and brakes as hard as they can. And then as the downforce comes off on an F3 car, the driver will start to ease off the brake, trail brake in, again a little pause because it's quite a long hairpin so you need that coasting phase to let the front come in and away they go. So this is where you find out that one shape doesn't fit all when you're looking at the basics again, right? So sit down with the engineer when you're testing a new car, understand exactly what the hairpins need to be, you know, what's the braking point for like turn five, the braking shape, sorry, for turn five. What does this car need from me as a driver? Then look at a different corner, okay, medium speed. How do I need to approach that on the brake? And the high speed, if it still needs a brake, how does this car want to be driven? You as a driver, you have to understand your car. You can't just drive it the way you want to drive it. It, has to, it reacts a certain way and you need to understand how it reacts to certain inputs that you actually create and you put into the car. Important. Pro tip number two is use your brake references. Now these are braking markers, right? 
different corners have got things on the approach that you can use as a bit of a breaking marker, a bit of a reference. So it could be like the 100 meter board or the start of a curve. It could be like a shaved part of the tarmac underneath on approach and you know that's there and you can see it in the dry anyway. Um, it could be on a street circuit, you've got like a white patch or an orange patch on the barrier and a, a zebra crossing across the road. So you're approaching the corner and you know, right, the 100 meter board is pretty much a good benchmark for where I should start to break. Spoke to the engineer, we did our trap walk, we talked about the corner entry and we decided using data and using obviously onboard video from previous visits from other drivers, that that's a roundabout where you need to break. It's gonna change, obviously. It's gonna change due to weather conditions. It's gonna change to how quick you're actually approaching. Maybe you didn't have a very good exit from the corner before it, so you're approaching a little bit slower than you would normally. So maybe then you can break a bit later. If you've got a really big headwind, you can break later. If you've got a tailwind, you better break a bit earlier than the normal marker. But that 100 meter board, it's not gonna be on the absolute optimal point to break, is it? Someone hasn't put it there because that's where you need to break with your car, with your tire wear that you've got, the brake discs, you know, how, how well they're performing, how quick you can go down the gears. All these things are taken in consideration. But I would say use a braking reference to sort of have a kind of area that you know you're gonna play with. Sometimes it's just after, sometimes it's just before. So pick it out if it's possible. It could even be a bump in the road. You know, as soon as you go over the bump, that's when you have got to hit the brake. And it's really important to have a marker or at least a reference when you're in traffic. So say it's the first lap, everyone's side by side, there's four, you're four abreast, there's three abreast in front, there's cars everywhere. It's good to be aware of where that braking marker is because you might not be able to see it. You might get distracted by the car in front or looking around and all of a sudden you miss your braking point. So you've got to understand where it is for then as well and people do it all the time. If there's 20, 30 of you barreling into turn one or lap one or on the second lap, you can pretty much guarantee someone's gonna miss their braking point. Make sure it's not you. Pro tip number three is for right foot breakers or heel and toe in, keep a constant brake pressure. Now this is something that happens when you know what heel and toe is, right? It's another basic thing. Like this guy in this video now, you're braking with the right foot and you're blipping the throttle as you dip the clutch to make sure that your downshift is seamless. Because you know when you downshift and you, wham, you feel the car, the engine brake in, heel and toe stops that from happening. So you give it a blip of the throttle and it'll click down a gear without really giving you much of a transition between the difference in speed of the gears. It won't lock up so much. So you have to blip to get that in, right? Problem is, when you're blipping, it's easy for the driver to be pressing the brake, blip the throttle, and they come off the brake. So then they have this inconsistent brake shape where they've come off the brake as they're downshifting. You can see it here on the data. That's what I want you to avoid. You keep that brake on and blip in a way, and this takes practice, and use data that you don't come off the braking on so your car is doing like the kangaroo and again under braking and you're losing braking distance. You wanna really use that gear, right, to slow you down, but you don't wanna come off the brake. So that's something to be careful of and something that a lot of people miss out on. Pro tip number four, look for dog legs. Interesting one, <laughs> not dogs on the track, but you know when you've got a speed trace on the data, I'll show you one here, you can see the speed of somebody who's braking correctly, it's a nice diagonal line, then the other line underneath shows you that they've braked, but then they've slightly come off the brake and there's a dog leg in their speed trace. That means you've either braked too early or you broke too hard, too suddenly and you're too efficient and then you've had to come off because you can see that the corner is still not here. A bit like the heel and toe one where they come off the brake while they're blipping. People do this in braking. When they're, then, when, they have, when they're doing it with the left foot. And you don't want that. So look out for the dog legs because that's actually showing you that you're over slowing it too early. Usually, brake deeper. So you've got that nice diagonal line and that's just the speed coming off and that's pretty much the car on the limit and it can't really brake anymore. But if you can see that you've braked, you've come off and then braked again and you can just see that dog leg. That's not what an engineer wants to see. It's not what a top driver should be seeing. So look for them when you're doing your data debrief, pounce on them and see if it's something you can change in your braking. Pro tip number five is change your brake bias for different corners. Something that we all know. Now the brake bias is obviously where you've got an adjuster in the race car and you can put more braking force through the front wheels 
or the rear and you say, right, I'm starting to lock up the fronts now. So I better just put some more brake force to the rear. So when I hit that pedal, it distributes a little bit more brake into the rear to stop me locking at the front. And that brake bias there is one of the major tools. In F2 and F3, we use it to look after the tires. If the rears are getting too hot, we start to put the brakes near the front so the brakes are not causing too much heat. So it's done for that reason. But also, as you're driving, if you're starting to lock front wheels, if you're starting to lock rear wheels, start to take the brake bias or the brake pressure off that axle. And you can do that during a lap. So you're coming towards a hairpin, right? And you know that I can actually really put some braking on the front wheels because all the weight's gonna be on the front, right? When you brake hard. So that means downforce on the front. So I can put a bit more brake to the front and they won't lock because they've got so much force pushing them into the ground. Now a medium speed one, where you or, or a high speed one, where you kind of need a little bit more rotation in the car, so a bit more like a handbrake, where you want the, the back wheels to brake more, you can click the bias to the rear and as you brake, it's, it's got more braking to the rear so then it sort of makes the rear slide and it gives you free rotation without turning the wheel. And you can see top drivers, Michael Schumacher was always playing it, playing with this. So you've got all these different types of corners, right? So you've got hairpin, I'm going to go forward on the brake bias. Perfect. The next one now is a series of high speed where I do need to dab the brake a bit. So I want a bit of rotation. I want, I'm going to put it to the back. Just a, just a click or two, so I've got more brake into the back. There's another hairpin coming, I'm going to go to the front again. And they're doing this while they're up shifting and doing all the other things on the steering wheel. That's available to you as well. So if you're starting to snatch the fronts, you know, you're starting to lock up, just think, right, can I put the brake bias to the rear just a bit on the go on this particular corner? And then maybe you put it back again. This is multitasking. Now F1 cars have gone the next level. They changed the diff settings, the way the throttle map is and everything for each corner or for each main corner. So the driver's changing the setup of the car completely for each corner, but you can do brake bias, I'm sure. Pro tip number six is always know where the wind is coming from. I see a lot of people forgetting about this as well. You're coming to the corner, you've got a headwind, like I said earlier, you can brake pretty late because that wind is literally pushing against the front of the car. It's gonna help you slow down. Also, if it's behind, it's forcing you into the corner a bit more. You've got not as much wind coming from the front and you've got quite a bit coming from behind. You probably have to brake a bit earlier because it's pushing you into the corner. And it's it, this is often missed but it's, it shouldn't be missed if you're after that last tenth, that last two tenths of a second over a lap time. Understand, is it a crosswind? Is it a headwind? What corners is it a headwind in? It's a headwind into number one and number 10. That's Bahrain. That was a reality. Now there's a white line that goes across the floor on the track of turn 10. And that was pretty much a good braking reference for F2, F3 kind of cars. F1 was later. But on a certain day, I think it was Saturday, the wind was behind the drivers there all of a sudden for the first time. And they were out braking themselves. They were braking where they normally brake on the day before, but now they were just going wide and missing the corner. It was like, remember, the wind is behind you now. It makes that much of a difference. And people were messing up and losing their fastest lap because of it. They had to abandon and they started way behind where they should have just because the wind changed. And the people that are switched on were coming out the pit lane, looking at the huge flag, having the engineer tell them where the wind is and understanding where it is, what corners it will be affecting. And that allows them to do a complete lap without making a mistake. Because it can often, you know, it can often catch you out and you don't think about it, but it can. So really understand where's the wind coming from. Pro tip number seven is use engine braking. This is more for manual gearboxes. If we go back to like the Formula Ford, that was like a, a car with four gears, maybe five, the, the more modern ones, but it was four when I did it. And you would blip, obviously braking, blipping down and kind of being a bit harsh or a bit early on the downshift to semi lock the rears, to just make them under rotate a little bit to help slow the car down. So it weren't just the brakes that were slowing you down, you were using the gear and the engine braking to really scrabble it to a halt. And also it allowed you to rotate the car if you did it at the right time. You pull the clutch, you, you dip the clutch obviously when you're downshifting with the blip. And as you release the clutch, it just semi locks and it's not locked up. 
it's just under rotating, it's the slip. You're giving yourself that 5% of slip where the wheels are going just a little bit slower than the car and it's scrabbling for grip. This is now the fine details. This is where we get to dancing with the car and it's the art of being a driver, is using the mechanical um, part of the car to slow, help slow you down. Electronic cars with flappy paddles um, often don't let you down the gears early because they, they're programmed to, not, to help you avoid blowing the engine up. So you'll be asking for like fourth, third, second, a bit earlier than you should, and it won't let you. So the more mechanical cars that have got a H pattern gearbox, you can actually use that to help slow you down. Again, I keep saying this, it's very basic stuff, but it's pro tips and it's stuff that people forget to do. It's all there, all these tools. You got the bias, you got the wind. You've actually, now you've got the wheels that you can actually get down the gears early and help you slow down and balance the car for you or rotate the car for you. This is the, the, the gray area of driving. These are the shaded bits that you can't even really see on data when you're looking, but somebody's in the car is good at these, this stuff. It all builds up and you know, all comes together and it gives them a lap time that is very impressive. They're dancing with the car. Use your tools, even the downshift. Pro tip number eight, for high downforce cars, turn in and then adjust your speed. When you come into a high speed corner, we kind of saw it in the F3 car example I showed you, and I'll show you again. What you may have noticed is that even though the brake shape is very different to the other two cars, it's actually much later. The F3 car is actually turned in already before they brake. So the other two cars, the GT and the Formula Ford, the wheel's pretty much straight, they brake, and they're just coming off the brake as they bleed in, right? As they turn into the corner. The F3 car, because it's got that much downforce, you can turn in first and then come off the throttle and do a little brake. So it's already in. It's like an aeroplane. You want it to turn. You don't want to like um, shock the car with a brake by putting the wheel, you know, the weight on the front and then turn because you'll, you'll get a snap oversteer. But if you can turn in and then adjust as you're going in, that's the fastest way. And this is for like an F3, a GB3, a British F3 um, in, in England. Anything that's got very good downforce. It's got wings, it's being sucked to the ground. F1, they break virtually into the apex in some of these corners. They turn in and then it's a good like half a second before they even bloody break in. So that's the kind of thing to remember as well. And it, it, might, it might sound obvious, but there's a lot of drivers on the current grids that are still not doing that. I'd say the top three or four are doing it. They t they've got the confidence to go into like a cop's corner. If they need to adjust, some of these are flat anyway, flat out. If they need to adjust the speed, then they do it after they've turned in. So the car's already loaded, and then they just adjust and go through. Pro tip number nine is take the track layout into consideration. Right, so you're coming to a corner. Again, when you're looking at things in a very basic way and trying to have a law for everybody, this is how you're supposed to break at a corner, you've always got to take into consideration cambers. Is the corner uphill? Is it downhill? Is it cambered away? Has it got a crest in the middle of the braking zone? Um, what's it actually like? Has it got bumps on the way in? This all affects your braking. So like Shell Oils at, um, at, at Alton Park, that corner's got a big bank in. So it's nice when you've got a corner like that because you can actually, if you look at it, it looks like a hairpin, right, from above. You're like, okay, brake in a nice straight line, take a little bit in and, uh, you know, trail brake and on you go. It's not really like that. This one, because it's got so much bank in, you can go into it, a bit like turn three of Zandvoort. That's an extreme version. You can go into these corners pretty fast, like breaking a little bit too late, it seems. But then because it's cambered, you can just crash that front right or front left, whichever way it goes, and dig it into the tarmac to help you slow down. So you're using the camber of the track to slow you down. Instead of slowing the car down and being really patient and waiting and then going, you throw it in. <laughs> You're pretty much taking too much speed. Use the front if it's got a good tire that doesn't, you know, if it's a Pirelli, you've got to be careful because you'll kill, destroy the front left, the front right or front left. But if it's a fairly durable tire, you can push it into the camber and use that and help it to slow you down. And as it starts to grip, it can actually grip in and cause rotation in the car, oversteer a little bit and help you get a good exit. So just think about that as well. And um, turn three of Red Bull Ring is very uphill. 
So normally when you're approaching a corner at the speed you do there, you'd be breaking around the 100 meter mark. But because it's uphill, you can go to like the 70, 60 meter mark. And that's where you break just because it's a bloody great hill. And so many people are breaking on it. It's got very thick rubber on the, on the surface. So you're really using the rubber, you're using the gradient to help you slow you down. And you want to get off that brake because you don't want to be slowing down uphill too long to get back on the power as early as you can. So yeah, have a look at that as well. So um, another big one actually is Snetterton, the S's. You've got, two, you've got one braking area, but you actually come on the brake twice. You press it initially to slow it down. Then you've got a slight corner, so you come off the brake, and then you press it again because you've got a sharp right-hander afterwards. And that's also a kind of a combination corner, but you've got to understand that hardly any braking area is straightforward. It's not like a billiard table smooth, perfect grip, and a very obvious angle to the corner. There's all, the, all these things, camber, bumps, curb. Can I use the curb? Can I use a bit of curb on the way in to help rotation under the braking, believe it or not? All these things have to be taken into consideration when you're looking and doing a trap walk. It's like, okay, I can see I can break around the 100, but actually maybe I can go a bit deeper because I can use the camber. Be a master at this. Start to look at corners in a way that other people are not realizing and just driving over it. Use the corner for what it is. There'll be something there that's either helping you or hindering you under the braking area. But be the driver that knows this. Be clever. And the last pro tip is to aim to have a slightly under-rotated front wheel. Sounds bizarre, right? Speaking to some really, really top drivers, fast, fast drivers, they get a kick, right? Say there's a hairpin. They get a real kick out of this right-hand hairpin. They're braking and they can just see, especially single-seater drivers, because in, in touring cars and GTs, you can't really see the wheels, obviously. But in single-seaters, you can see those wheels, you can see the paint on the sides, where it says Pirelli, Goodyear, or whatever, Cooper tires. And, and the top drivers really get a kick, and it's like a challenge, is to when, when they're going into a slow corner, they like to have the inside wheel, which is like the corner you're gonna be turning. If you're turning right, it'd be the front right, that's the inside wheel, is just starting to under-rotate. So they can start to see that it's slowing down. All the other three wheels are pretty much like the same speed, but this one just starts to lock up, but not quite. It's under rotating, it's got the slip, like 3%, 5% slip, it's slower than it is with the other three tires. And they know if, if they do that, then they are braking on the absolute limit. Any earlier braking, it wouldn't be under rotating. Any later, it would be a full genuine lock up but they're just on the edge of it. It's just scrabbling, like I said about the rear tires, just scrabbling. The front right or the front inside tire needs to be doing that as well. And that's when you know you're on it. It's kind of like, it's a barometer. It's like a feedback for how well I'm braking is when that happens. Because you need to obviously hit the brake really hard at the start in most, most cars. And then you bleed off the brake as you get close to the corner. And if it's just starting to under rotate and then you're in the corner, it's like, oh, it's beautiful. And I have had drivers come back to me and say, oh mate, turn 10, I did it. It was absolutely amazing. And you look at the data and it's like, blown their teammates out of the water. They were on the limit. So this is just a little thing to look for. Now, these are pro tips. I've like fired them at you like a machine gun. Um, but there'll be something in there. I promise you there's something in there that you could just remind yourself of when you're going to the next race weekend. Or even if you're on the sim, you can do this stuff. All of this is relevant on the sim. So take it on, have a look at the 10 and say, right, I think actually I can use number two, number four, number six at my next, next race weekend. And I'm just gonna keep them in the back of my mind when I'm doing my trap walk and things to, under, to just help me perform better. And when you're focusing on your driving in this way, this is really chiseling down to things and making it like you're crafting a lap. You know that this corner needs a certain different braking technique to the next. You know this car, what it needs. You know the cambers and stuff. Is there anything on the track that can help me brake or it's going to hurt my braking? Is there a way I can use the engine braking? And all these things. As a driver, it's your responsibility to not only know these, but use these. Whether it's the brake bias, the wind, all this is at your disposal, really, to use to get a lap time and to win and to do stuff that other drivers are not doing. That's what we're talking about here, really, isn't it? The advantage. So take a look, well, listen to this again. Make notes and make sure you use some of this going forward.